All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to our discussion of post-election politics from 2000 to 2020. My name is Nikki Maddie, and I'm a junior studying international relations and political science. And my name is Chichi Piazu. I'm also a junior, also studying international relations and Spanish. So for most undergraduates, undergraduates such as ourselves who only gained political consciousness in the past decade, the current political climate of bitter partisanship, chaos, disinformation, gridlock, and constant challenges to electoral results may be their only portrait of American politics. In history and political science courses, we study a version of American politics that is guided by constitutional wisdom, bipartisan compromises, and democratic principles. However, when we leave our classrooms and return to the present, we are jolted by the contrast between what we have learned about the promise of American democracy and the stark reality of its fate. During the 21st century and the aftermath of a national election, the United States has often appeared to be more bitterly divided than united by the democratic process. Just five days before a national election, whose results will shape the trajectory of the United States recovery from a deadly pandemic, a deepening economic crisis, and a reckoning with the lasting racial injustice that exists in our country, a conversation about post-election politics could not be more relevant. Before we begin this discussion, we would like to thank the Institute for Global Leadership, the International Relations Department, the Office of the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life for their sponsorship of this critical discussion. And for our speakers. So tonight, we're graciously joined by Matt Bai, a nationally known journalist, author, and screenwriter. Matt graduated from Tufts in 1990 and participated in that year's epic symposium, The Militarization of the Third World. Starting in 2002, he covered three presidential campaigns for the New York Times, where he was the chief political writer for the Sunday Magazine and columnist for the newspaper. He then spent five years as the national political columnist for Yahoo News, and then in January 2020, he became a contributing columnist for the Washington Post. By his most recent book, all the Truth is Out, The Week Politics Went Tabloid, looks at no the notorious scandal involving presidential candidate Gary Hart in 1987 and how it shaped the political and media culture. We are also joined by Ambassador Daniel Feldman. Dan is the senior counsel at Covington in Washington, D.C. and participated in the 1988 epic colloquium on foreign policy imperatives for the next presidency. He graduated from Tufts in 1989 to begin his illustrious career. He served as an OSCE supervisor, election supervisor in Bosnia, Herzegovina for local elections in 1997. And from 1999 to 2000, he served as the director for multilateral and humanitarian affairs at the National Security Council, where he helped oversee US policy on all war crimes issues, including the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The particular relevance to our discussion today, he subsequently served on the Gore-Lieberman presidential campaign and was a crucial member of the election recount team in 2000. He went on to become the counsel and communications advisor on the staff for Senator Lieberman for the Senate Government Affairs Committee, and he helped spearhead the first hearings into Homeland Security's issues after 9-11. He then helped build the first and only legal practice in the country in corporate social responsibility at Foley Hook which advises multinational companies on international human rights, labor rights, and environmental standards. He was accorded the personal rank of ambassador by President Obama for his work as the deputy and then special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. He served as a principal advisor to secretaries of state John Kerry and Hillary Clinton regarding Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the broader South Central and East Asian issues. Ambassador Feldman will bring this wealth of experience, insight, and knowledge to our discussion, and we could not be more excited to welcome him and Matt back to Tufts today. And then before we begin, we encourage all attendees to submit their questions into the Q&A, and we'll get to those very soon. So this is for um, both Matt and Dan, but contrary to popular belief, if you're my age, a uh, quote unquote hanging Chad is not when someone in a frat goes in for a high five and you leave them hanging. That is not what a hanging Chad is. It refers to the piece of paper hanging when a ballot is not completely punched through and was popularized in the 2000 Bush v. Gore election as ballot counters did not include them in the total vote count. If you can name one peculiarity to voting this time around in the way that the hanging chads were in 2000, what would it be? 
I think Dan's got to have a hanging Chad somewhere in that office. Absolutely. Several. As a, as a memento. Uh, do you want me to start? Yeah. Um, so first of all, thanks uh, to all the entities at Tufts, which, uh, which invited us back. It's always great to be connected and reconnected with Tufts, even if virtually in this, um, in these kind of bizarre times. Uh, and to uh, Nikki and, and Chi Chi and Heather and everybody else for, um, for facilitating this. Um, I do think it's a really timely discussion, obviously. And, um, and there is certainly um, uh, a line connecting where we were in 2000 in, Flor uh, in Florida and where we are 2020 now. And the Hanging Chad piece is, is part of that. Um, I, like everybody else, had no idea what a Hanging Chad was until uh, elect the day after election day. Um, I was um, on the campaign in Nashville and then uh, doing completely uh, non-legal work, communications work and, um, and some foreign policy work. And uh, when it looked, uh, when we started having a recognition of what was happening transpiring in Florida, they pulled everyone who happened to have a legal uh, degree down from the campaign um, down to Tallahassee. I was in that um, initial group that went there. And um, we set up shop in this uh, uh, small little um, law office in Tallahassee with about um, 20 of us uh, in, uh, stuffed into, uh, into maybe three rooms. And I had a utility closet with a, um, with a card table on it and a sign outside the door that said Chad boy, <laughs> because we were figuring out what it, hanging Chad actually meant. Uh, and you're right, uh, for those who don't know, it was the indentation on a ballot um, where um, uh, it didn't fully kind of fall out, but was, was still there. But you would hope from the hanging nature of it that you could tell the intent of the voter um, um, by looking at that. And so all the ballots that either weren't counted because uh, there was some confusion about it or potentially miscounted really made up the difference in Florida in this incredibly contested election. Um, and the vote total that just separated um, Bush and Gore uh, came down to 537 votes, I think. Um, and had we actually counted all the ballots, my firm belief 20 years later still is that more people in Florida went to the polls thinking that they voted for Al Gore uh, than they did for George W. Bush. And that, that probably could have been uh, uh, determined if you had actually looked at the intent of the voters in the ballot. I think that that same, since, since then, what we have seen um, is a, is a Republican Party that is increasingly dependent on seeking to disenfranchise uh, voters and to suppress voters and is not interested in determining the will of the voters in every instance in the way that we saw it in 2000 and that we're seeing now in a plethora of ways. Look at all the court cases that have been announced just in the last few days in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Texas and Alabama. And, you know, do you put uh, only have one receptacle for absentee ballots uh, per county? And can you help disabled uh, voters uh, at, the, at the curbside? And can you count ballots that are mailed before election day and come in? I mean, all of these efforts by the Republican Party are to sy systematically disenfranchise the will of the voters. And um, I think that is a clear through line. To your one question on on what would be the equivalent um, in this election, I just you know before this call saw that the the New Yorker has a has an article basically suggesting calling uh, Pennsylvania and Harrisburg uh, could well be in 2020 what uh, Tallahassee was in in 2000, and if that's the case and it all boils down to Pennsylvania, which doesn't start counting absentee ballots until uh, the day of election and where. The, the number, sheer number and magnitude of absentee ballots that have been sent in uh, is just staggering compared to what had been done historically. And that there are very clear efforts by Republicans uh, to try to discount as many of those as possible. And in the, the, um, the Pennsylvania example in particular, there's, you know, per Pennsylvania law, you have to have two envelopes um, uh, to cast an absentee ballot. You need a, uh, an envelope, um, a secrecy envelope, and then you put it inside another envelope. Uh, and there have been now court rulings that if you don't have uh, both envelopes, you can throw out that ballot. And so this idea, what they, they're calling naked ballots, missing that second secrecy envelope, I think could well be used um, uh, to undermine the will of the people in Pennsylvania at, at you know, potentially numbers that would really change the outcome of that state and the outcome of the national election, considering that millions of ballots could be impacted in that way and only 
45,000 votes separated uh, Trump and Hillary Clinton four years ago. So um, we'll see if um, if naked ballots or secrecy envelopes uh, becomes the new hanging chad. Uh, but it's it's efforts like that that I think could well occur. That's pretty good. The naked ballot. I never heard that. I like that. Um, well, uh, let me just let me just echo Dan and uh, thank you for doing this. I'm always surprised when Tufts is so happy to have me back, but I appreciate it. And uh, and and Nikki and Chichi and, and Heather, you uh, it's you know it's it's fun to talk to you all and hear about what's what's going. See that the campus is vibrant, even though there's nobody on it. Um, I also want to know for the record that Dan is older than I am. You heard that in the bios. He's he he continues by, to by months, not years. <laughs> Um, uh, and he made all that stuff up. I refuse to call him ambassador. Um, <laughs> I will say, you know, it's funny because we've had this conversation for many years between us or versions of this conversation. I, you know, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, I would have said that Dan was being hyperbolic to talk about a Republican Party that was hell bent on denying people the vote as sort of a systematic philosophy. It's hard to argue with now. I mean, it just, this is what they're doing. You see the papers every day. Obviously, demographic change has not been kind to the Republican Party. I would say the Republican Party has not been kind to demographic change, right? They've had plenty of opportunity uh, and plenty of potential candidates to get to 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 be able to compete um, for that changing vote, you know, a younger vote, a less white vote, uh, in, in a, a more urban vote. And they seem to have not been able to do that. And now they are resorting to literally trying to stop people to vote everywhere they can. It's, I, I don't know, you know, I, I've, look, I know a lot of people I have lunch with a Republican today. You know, I mean, I, I, I have, uh, I've spent, you know, years talking to a lot of Republicans of conscience. I don't know how you get up. I mean, I understand that a lot of them now are anti-Trump, but you do have to get up at some point and look in the mirror and say, what am I doing here? What is my mission? And is my party systematically trying to stop people from voting, as Dan says? Um, so I think that's real. I mean, Look, I, I would preface this by saying I think there's a very good chance, right? I mean, uh, you know, I say this and like, you know, who knows? Sitting here today, I think there's a very good chance that none of this will matter all that much. Um, Pennsylvania is clearly a trouble spot and there are others. And my guess if I was sitting here today, not that anybody's asking me to guess, is that we're looking at something a little bit less like 2000 and more like the end stage of the Clinton Obama race in 2008, where everybody kind of knows where it's going. The numbers are clear, but it's got to play itself out. So they'll file suit in a couple states and they'll count a lot of ballots for weeks and there will be arguments in court cases. But the margin seems to me today to be too large to make any, to make that matter for the outcome. You know, I mean, it's one thing to win an election by two points in the popular vote and lose the electoral college. And we've seen situations like that now twice and uh, you know, which is unprecedented in American history. We, and, and in all of your lifetimes talking to students, that's the nature of a presidential campaign, right? If somebody, get, if somebody wins by five points, it's a landslide, but that's not actually the history of American politics. And you don't win uh, an election by seven, eight, nine points in the popular vote and lose the electoral college. That We're not that urbanized, we're not that polarized. It's, it, it can't, I don't think that can happen. I don't think that can happen. <laughs> I don't think we're there yet. It's, it's possible. But so, you know, to me, it looks today like we may not be looking at one state for the next two weeks. Um, I didn't know about naked ballots. I really like that one. I'm kind of intrigued. I'm not an expert. I'm not nearly as much of an expert in the mechanics of the, of the ballots. But I'm intrigued by the postmark, non-postmark ballots. There's also an issue in Pennsylvania and elsewhere where, you know, I think it's in Pennsylvania where you're not, you know, you, you can throw out a ballot that's not postmarked, uh, but not all ballots get postmarked. So I, I don't know, I'd call them, you know, I, I, I call them ghost ballots, right? It's like ballots that exist, but they don't really exist. They're not, they're not postmarked and therefore they're floating in some kind of netherworld. That to me seems like it could really become um, another serious issue in the counting because, um, you know, if, if, if you've got a ballot and you know it very likely came in before election day, it's sitting in a pile and it doesn't have a postmark, which for some reason, a lot of them don't. I, I don't know how you can deny that, that vote from being counted, but people will try to find a way. I'll also say one other thing, I, we can get into this. I'm not going to go on about it, but I would be curious to hear Dan talk about it at some point. I think it's curious to know how the Supreme Court would, if this really does matter, where the court nets out. 
because I think we're all looking at these decisions this week and trying to figure this out. It's not cut and dry. It's not like, oh, conservative court, Trump's golden. There are a lot of layers to that. And I don't think anybody quite knows how this would get resolved. There are a lot of different, it seems to me on the court right now, there are a lot of different philosophies about uh, how you defer, who you defer to and how you defer back to a, to a state uh, jurisdiction. Yeah, I think the, the decisions are still coming so fast and furious that it's hard to uh, make those determinations at this point. I mean, you had the uh, decision which um, curtailed uh, counting um, uh, ballots that uh, after that weren't received by election day that uh, Kavanaugh wrote, um, uh, and that was a uh, I think a five a five to three decision. You had uh, four four decisions um, that favored uh, voter. Um, uh, enfranchisement and so that the more progressives uh, voted uh, with uh, the chief justice and that upheld a more progressive lower court. It, you know, the one thing that we do know is that the Supreme Court is usually quite reticent to get involved in these. They really want to see everything else transpire first. It would really depend, I think, on how it ultimately percolated up to the court through um, what sorts of uh, filings. Was it a state Supreme uh, court decision? Was it through um, other uh, federal district court or appellate courts? Um, what was the, how narrow was the question at stake? Um, uh, and, you know, ultimately, if it is the 4-4 breakdown at this point um, that we saw, uh, I think on the, on which, on the pe recent Pennsylvania decision, that allowed for greater enfranchisement, what happens with the wild card of where Amy Coney Barrett comes out and if she decides to hear those and in, in, inside of those cases or not. Clearly, I think that given we've now have at least uh, three alums, I think, on the Supreme Court of the Bush v. Gore uh, legal team, all on the Bush side, <laughs> uh, with uh, I believe Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and, and, um, and, and Barrett, uh, I think Roberts, you know, Roberts too. I think was it Roberts also? Then maybe then maybe it wasn't Gorsuch. I, I may be wrong there. Uh, I know it was Kavanaugh and Barrett, and I thought there was a third. But um, but 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 regardless, uh, I think you know on these voter suppression issues in general that they still revert fundamentally to um, to a conservatism there. Uh, but it would depend on um, on the on the nature of the of the filings and the appeals, and I think to a certain degree on where the country is at that point. I mean, they don't, they really don't want to wade in uh, to these uh, broad issues that impact, um, you know, civic strife and a whole range of other issues. But we're, if we're in a situation where, uh, you know, for instance, it's been, it's been quite clear that uh, Biden has well surpassed the 270 electoral vote threshold and uh, and the president is uh, is refusing to concede or anything else. You would hope that those would be the circumstances that a Supreme Court, regardless of partisanship, would stand up for the rule of law and the fundamental tenets of a democracy. Yeah. Switching to another area of post-election politics that I haven't heard y'all touch on um, is kind of about the fears of violence that we're seeing um, exhibited on social media. And indeed, last week, the Boston Globe ran a piece entitled with fears of a contested election growing, more Americans are stocking up to ride out any discord. The article describes how families have begun stocking up on essential items and even arms for fear of a violent conflict as a result of the election. So I have to ask, how warranted are these fears? Or worse, are preparations like this more likely to lead to a post-election conflict? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I, I don't know the answer. I don't think anybody knows the answer. Uh, I've worried about it for a long time. And I think in the last couple of weeks, there's been more reason for that fear because there are these clashes breaking out all over and between protesters and counter protesters that are really, you know, not surprising, but, but troubling. I don't think we're going to have mass unrest uh, in the streets of the country, but I, 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 I do think there will be uh and angry groups, no matter what. And I think there will be, you know, there, there is, uh, there are loud and dangerous minorities of, of, of voters, you know, in, in particularly on the conservative side, particularly on the Trump side, um, who, uh, you know, who 
uh, probably will not accept the outcome no matter what. So, you know, I, I, look, I think the potential's there. I would, I would say the potential's probably never been greater than it is right now. I don't think it's Armageddon. I don't think you need rations. I don't think we need, you know, shelters. But uh, we, are a, we are a country in sort of social crisis. And it's definitely spilling over into violence. And look, I mean, that's going to be the first task. Like if Joe Biden wins this election, I think he's going to. I think it's very likely the Senate will go Democratic as well, but it's hard to say. You know, that's his first task. That's his first job, right? He's not going to unite the country overnight, but he is going to have to keep social order and create a sense of calm and a restoration of normalcy. And it's going to be, it's not a uh, slow burn crisis. I think it's going to be urgent. I think that's something he needs to do first and urgently. And, uh, and I think he's able to do that, is my guess. And he's really made that a hallmark of his campaign. I mean, in terms of the battle for the soul of the nation, but also, you know, his um, talking about the importance of institutions and um, uh, in trying to heal the country, recognizing that it will be extremely difficult. I, I mean, look, I, I, uh, I, I like Matt, I mean, I also obviously nobody knows uh, what the nature of this is. I mean, I, I tend uh, to, you know, <laughs> having been an alum of the of the 2000 Gore campaign, the 2004 Kerry campaign, and the 2008 and 2006 Hillary campaigns, uh, I'm a classic uh, PTSD Democrat, and I tend to worry, <laughs> um, and I won't stop worrying, I don't think, until January 20th, um, uh, because there's a lot to worry about. Um, and all the, the parade of horribles that we are now thinking about, in addition to the systemic voter suppression efforts and everything else, but the, you know, the vying electoral slates by state, the civic unrest, foreign information and disinformation, foreign, foreign interference and disinformation, um, National Guard, I mean, all these issues that have been surfaced recently, you know, have some basis in you know, they have some legitimate basis. There's a reason that people are surfacing them because of how polarized we are and because uh, there will be some people on both sides, but particularly Trump supporters who will not take uh, the victor of the other. Um, but, and so I would say, sure, be prepared in the same way that we've been prepared for the last eight months, go, you know, stock up on toilet paper and, you know, get staples that you you may not be able to, to, to get all the time. On, on the other hand, um, I think that, the goal of Tr President Trump over the last few years, and especially over the last few months, is to try to um, delegitimize uh, the the election, and and um, and in all of his talk about voter fraud from day one of his presidency, through um, the uh, you know casting doubt on absentee ballots and voting ballots and everything else, and the more that we all talk about it and and give in to our our uh, the darker forces and worrying and everything else, the more I think it confirms the delegit delegitimizing aspect of it. And so I think we need to be prepared. I think that um, you know certainly far more <laughs> thinking and effort has gone into this contingency planning on the de democratic side than has ever happened before, you know, certainly in 2000 when a bunch of us just got up and moved to Tallahassee and became uh, elections law experts in a few days. Um, and all of these scenarios are being gamed out and uh, we should, we, we, we must prep for them. Um, but by the same token, I hope that we, you know, we have to continue to keep confidence in our electoral system. It has not been fraudulent, it, you know, Trump's own counsel on, on voter integrity found that there was no uh, widespread fraud, the FBI, you know, director said this again earlier this year. I mean, there is no proof of this. We have to have faith in our institutions, um, and uh, and 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 we need to um, make sure that there is a a smooth transition and peaceful transition of power. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. So now we're transitioning into our audience questions. Like we said, feel free to submit your own via the Q and A. Um, so this first question um, may be from someone you all may know, but it's from Sol Gittleman. And essentially the question is, Republicans 
or Dan, Republicans now, but isn't voter suppression in American DNA? Southern Blacks in the 1930s and 1940s, Trump and the Republicans are off, oh, Trump's and the Republicans are awful, um, but isn't this what has been going on for centuries in all political parties in this country? And it said Dan, but I'm sure Matt, you can answer too. Paul <laughs> doesn't want to hear from me. He's heard from <laughs> me enough for one lifetime. That was just because Saul always um, uh, uh, make sure to, to to call me in class. I think. Um, uh, look, I, Saul obviously knows this um, uh, better than anyone, and uh, and I would give anything to be uh, back in one of his history classes and have the broader context on all this. And I'm I'm delighted, Saul, that you're. Um, uh, tuned into this, and of course, um, I'm sure every bit involved um, as a uh, as a public citizen, as you as you always were, and and inspired in all of us to be. Um, yes, absolutely. Voter suppression goes back centuries, and there there are many um, there there are many examples of it, particularly post Civil War and Jim Crow South and elsewhere. Um, and it was done by by uh, both parties in uh, in those days, and especially you know by the by the Democratic Party of the late 19th century, early early 20th century, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be calling it out when it's happening right now in in, in a particularly systemic manner. And uh, and so for any number of reasons, for a functioning and healthy democracy, I think we have to have um, far more uh, uh, national uh, standards and rights, and and we should be looking at redressing this. Um, I think through. Through through federal legislation, I think that would include um, uh, making sure that people could take off uh, election day so that they they can vote and wait in line. That there are certain um, uh, standards uh, for uh, how ballots are counted, how many days out, um, uh, and that there is the ability um, uh, to on a much more wide scale uh, basis for voter education. Um, uh, voter um, mobilization um, and uh, and ensuring that voters are supported in their efforts um, and that um, and and there are any number of examples on ways to address this. I mean, we're looking at um, whether felons can vote in Florida. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, it, um, how um, those who have been purged. Um, uh, from voter rolls can 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 seek to vote. How do you should we have same day uh, voter registration? Um, are there laws uh, that can demand uh, signatory matches and things like that? There are certainly things that can and should be done in this day and age um, that we have not been able to do before in our national history, and um, which uh, I think any healthy and well functioning democracy should have as 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 the, the core of its voter rights. Yeah, let, let me piggyback on that a, a bit. I, I agree, and I and and I'm going to push back a little bit on Saul because I've been doing that for 30 years, and he expects it from me. But I, it, you know, I don't I don't like arguments in general, like leaving voting aside. I don't like political arguments that begin, well, wasn't it always true, right? Like, didn't we see a guy came to within an inch of his life on the House of the floor? So, so on the floor of the United States House and or Senate. So clearly, you know, we're not, uh, you know, clearly. We've, you know, we've always been a divided and polarized country. Well, okay, but you know, there were a lot of things that were true in the 1800s or the 1900s that aren't true today. The point is as a country, we get better and better. We actually evolve. We don't take every step forward. We have dark moments. We tumble backward from time to time in various ways. But the, the, the mission here, the charge of every generation is to build a better country and a better system. And we do. We are a more tolerant country today for all the issues that you see in the paper every day than we have ever been. Certainly more tolerant than we were 30 or 40 years ago. We are, uh, you know, we, we are a, a more prosperous country than we were 100 years ago for all the inequality, for all the problem. We, we you know, we do uh, get, you know, evolve and change in a way that I don't think any other country really has. And and so I don't really accept like, you know, there's always, sure, there's always been some level of voter suppression. I mean, I guess you could say that it's just built into the 
the end of the country. But I, but I think we, we work to get better at it, and we do. And more people get to vote today, obviously. Whole, you know, women are voting, African Americans voting. You know, it, you know that, that wasn't true for a lot of the life of the country. Um, and that was shameful, but as a country, we evolve. And so, um, you know, I don't think that, I don't, I don't think that's, and I don't think Saul was saying this, I don't think that's an excuse for us or to say either that this isn't new or this is what you'd expect, or this is just the way American democracy is. I think, um, I think we're better than we were and we need to continue getting better. And we have to really sort of denounce and marginalize forces that would take the country backward because that's that's not how we not how we grow ever for matt's answer absolutely i mean in order to build a more a more perfect union this is this is what we do as we mature and evolve and and where is our you know we have abdicated leadership in so many areas i mean i think this past year it's been for someone who's involved in national security and foreign policy i mean it's been so demoralizing to see the eyes of the rest of the world look at our COVID response and say, where is the America that I grew up with? Where's the leadership? Where's the ability to go out and, and be creative and address these challenges? And we should be in the same way on, on, on voting rights as well. I mean, if we are holding ourselves out as the, as the model of democracy, if we are, are encouraging this in our in our alliances and our relationships and, and our foreign policy, then it's incumbent on us to keep doing better and keep getting better. And we should be out there um, making sure that that actually transpires. Something that's been weighing really heavily on me is that in the midst of such a historical seeming presidential election, it's been easy for local elections to fall under the radar. So I was wondering if there's anything across the board regarding the local elections that should that we should keep an eye out for. And I also wanted to tie this in with a question from Professor Rogers, uh, where she asks if, uh, if either of you are aware of state or local actions to protect the polls, especially on the election day, or preparations to respond to violence if it occurs. I don't. I that's a great question. I I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I would be very interested in it if anybody does. Uh, I would say on the, the state and local piece, the answer is yes, it matters. And it's something that I think Democrats did not focus on at their peril um, and to our disadvantage now for many, many years. I mean, it mattered in 2000 in Florida because at the end of the day, the, the one certifying the Florida electors was the, you know, not only the governor of the state who happened to be the candidate's brother, but the Republican Secretary of State, and uh, and who was who was the co-chair of his campaign in Florida, um, and there has been a very um, strategic, uh, consistent uh, effort by Republicans to look at to look at races and issues that have not gotten as much public attention um, and really changed the terrain. I would say the exact same issue on uh, judicial nominations, where you know it has been a concerted campaign now for. Uh, several decades um, to make the judiciary much more conservative in a very um, in a very strategic manner, and they have focused on state and local elections, uh, and especially in a year like this when it controls redistricting, um, they will be critical. And in terms of some of the some of the extraordinary circumstances we've talked about, such as um, uh, states that could wind up with dueling electoral slates. I mean, that happens when you've got um, you know, a, a legislature of one party and a governor of another. Uh, they're talking about it happening in, in Pennsylvania in particular, given the Republican legislature and the and Democratic governor. And, and so reclaiming many of these state houses uh, will be very, very important. It's an area that I wish we had focused on, um, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but it's the, uh, the old, um, you know, Chinese proverb of, you know, the, the, the best time to plant an oak tree is, is uh, a generation ago and the second best time is today. And we have to focus on, um, on, on continuing to work on those issues now. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, it's funny. I, I like Joe Biden. I've always liked him. And, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it's, I'll happily vote for him. I've said as much in a, in a bunch of columns and uh, I'm, not, I'm not a party guy, but I, I, I think he's the right guy for the moment. Having said that, right, if Joe Biden somehow loses this election next week or two months from now when they're done counting votes, some, after some time, the looming question will be, historically, 
at a critical juncture in the country will be, wait, how did you elect, how did you nominate a 77 year old white male 50 year politician, you know, at a time of such dynamic change in the country and in the party? And the answer is this, the answer is because they've done no development at the local level. They've not developed, who are the star governors in the Democratic Party? I could name a bunch I think are really good because it's my job, but go ask the average American, right? I mean, when I was a kid, you know, Mario Cuomo was a huge figure in national politics. Jerry Brown was a huge figure in national politics. Dick Celeste in Ohio, who no one remembers, right? The leaders of the Democratic Party were governors. Um, you know, and and uh, the, as Dan says, the, the Democratic Party has just done a terrible job of building uh, the bench, of, of caring enough about local leaders and, and, and empowering them and giving them platforms. And frankly, the leaders of that generation, I'm talking generally, you know, millennial say, have done a pretty terrible job of seizing that spotlight. They seem to have nothing to say. There's no clear agenda. They don't band together. They don't do anything like what Bill Clinton was doing in the you know, mid to late 1980s to get a bunch of people together around the country and say, hey, we need to think differently about issues. So it does really matter. I, I do think there's a very good chance that we walk away from this election uh, uh, with a major shift on the local and the national level. I mean, I think the Republican Party, there's a distinct possibility the Republican Party will be dealt a really serious blow and retribution for what they have allowed to happen for the last four years. Um, I, think the, I think that's kind of where the public is. And, um, and if that happens, it will be a real opportunity to do what Dan's talking about and, and to, to focus a little bit on what you're doing at the local level, what you want to achieve and who you want to promote. Awesome, thank you so much for answering that. That was incredibly insightful. Um, I have another question. Um, and so this one kind of elevates us from the state level to a more national, um, I guess, national level. So this question says, we just saw Chileans enter a ref referendum to rewrite their 1988 constitution with the US, which the US had a hand in engineering in order to create a more inclusive society democracy. How likely is a referendum of this magnitude to happen in the US when we consider the grievances against the electoral college? That's a Dan question. Uh, just because it originated in Chile. Um, <laughs> it's, it's about the world and all that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the thrust of the question is, you know, can we see such, uh, is it feasible, you know, politically feasible and pragmatic to see such overarching reform uh, in, the, in the US? Um, you know, would we have something akin to another constitutional convention at some point? It's hard to imagine that. Um, it's, uh, it's particularly hard to imagine that if, um, if someone like Joe Biden is the, is, is, is the president because he, um, has been an institutionalist and because he, I think, believes um, uh, also in, in those significant, also kind of incremental change. And so um, I think you will see it slowly. I mean, it's a, his answer to oil and fracking. I and mean, these things happen over a period of time. You, you, you can't go in and change uh, the system o overnight in this way. I, I So I, I don't necessarily see, you know, a uh, successful effort to abolish the Electoral College uh, right away if he were to become president or to have um, sweeping reform like in a constitutional convention. I do think that there will be a very, you know, especially if Democrats um, take the Senate, which I'm, I'm hopeful for, uh, and keep the House and, and Joe Biden as president, I think there's, uh, I know that there is an enormous uh, focus on um, what can actually have impact most immediately and how to start governing and passing um, uh, significant legislation and, and uh, uh, rectifying, remediating the, um, all the devastating actions of the, of the Trump administration as quickly as possible. And so um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if a Democratic Senate had uh, got rid of the filibuster at the very outset um, and started passing uh, legislation that um, 
that really makes a significant difference. And I think some of these things uh, would include um, uh, fundamental uh, uh, voting rights reforms. Uh, I think it was HR 1 that was introduced in the House at the beginning of the session, um, which is still kind of a, um, a blueprint for, for, for some of those. Uh, so I, I do think that there will be action, but I think it will be in a, um, in a fairly modulated manner as opposed to something you know, all, all, all at once. You know, it, it's funny, I'll, I'll say I'm torn about the Electoral College and, and I'm probably the only person left in any urban zip code who's torn about the Electoral College. But I, you know, I still feel, look, I, uh, I understand how people feel. I've always felt uh, we do live in a Republic of States. I, you know, having spent a lot of time looking at the politics on the local level in states, I think there's something valuable about that. I think it's been important in keeping the structure of the country and the social fabric together. I think, it, I think it's good for states to have local control. Uh, and I think the, the fact that the system is structured in such a way as it's not just sort of the mass, the, the, the tyranny of the majority, but that uh, smaller states can matter and get a say and that the states do send their electors, their representatives to Washington to take part in, in a sort of in that um, amalgamation, that confederacy. I, I, I like that system. I think it was smart. And I've generally felt that um, you know, this, that, that we're in a weird period. We, we had this weird moment in 2000. We had a weird moment again then in 2016 where the Electoral College, you know, and partly because of demographic change where the Electoral College and the popular vote were out of sync, but it's extraordinarily rare. And I've generally thought that um, it, it kind of works itself out after a particular moment. I don't know though, like I said, I'm torn because, uh, you know, look, if we have another election like this, not necessarily next week, but at any time in the next, you know, 20 years, if we're looking at now a series of elections where the country has just urbanized, gotten so out of whack to the point where increasing uh, margins of popular vote victory are, are nullified by the electoral college, then it, it just can't hold. You can't, you can't do that, right? You, you, you want the social fabric of the country can't hold, the political system can't hold and we won't make good choices. So, um, you know, so, so I, I, I'm interested. I mean, I, my, my hope for this election is that it puts a few things back in alignment. And, and one of them would be that the popular vote in the electoral college uh, send a pretty consistent message. And I think they will. And I would say, I mean, I do disagree on the electoral college because of these two seeming aberrations you know, in the last 20 years where it wasn't the tyranny of the majority, but in fact the tyranny of the minority, and right. um, and that you're increasingly seeing this, um, you know, institutionalized as well, including in our court system now, and and uh, and judges that have been um, uh, nominated by uh, Republicans, um, particularly Trump, and 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 uh, over the last few years, and where they're out of sync with where the majority of of Americans increasingly are. I, I, I agree that if they are in, <laughs> that if the popular vote and the electoral college are in vote, that together it's powerful. But you know, if we were to have another circumstance um, where they're not, then I think you're looking at you know a very broad swath of American society that feels right. completely disenfranchised and not represented in, at any level of their government. Yeah, that's right. We have another great question from our audience that ties into exactly what you guys were just talking about. Um, this is from John Miller, and he was asking, should the Democratic Party win the White House and the Senate? Do you expect that they will take a page from the Republican playbook? And if so, what page? All the wrong ones. <laughs> uh, John, John Miller, is, he's just baiting me now because he knows. <laughs> he's smart and he knows. Uh, look, I... I uh, this is a big thing of mine, and I, I've written it a bunch of times, and I think uh, over the years, because now I've had a lot of years to do this, that the, the, the biggest danger, and we, we've had, let me preface it this way. We've had three straight, uh, I got to update this. We've had four straight presidencies uh, where we've seen um, presidents lose control of the House. If Trump were to somehow be reelected, I think we'd see four straight presidencies where we've seen presidents lose control of the entire Congress at one point or another. That, that's never, we've never been close to that in American history. We never saw that twice before in American history. Um, so, I, I, you know, there's a ton of volatility in the system. And I think one of the reasons is that people misread their mandate. You know, the, the public is furious and wants change and, and 
punishes incumbency uh, pretty consistently. And parties win on this anti-incumbent wave. And the first thing they do is look in the mirror and go, I won because people agree with me. And they agree with me about everything. And now I'm going to enact my whole agenda. Two years later, they get tossed out again because people are not really making a, a statement about ideology or direction. They don't really trust anybody. They just want someone to come in and, 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 and govern uh, competently and, and, and make things work better. So uh, I think the, the, the thing I worry about for Democrats um, is that you, you will get a, a big wave perhaps next week and or some version of a democratic victory uh, and they will immediately assert that they have a mandate to enact uh, a lot of programs that they really haven't explained very clearly and that are not at the heart of why people are voting the way they are. And I think it's incumbent on a president and a party not to assume that mandate, but to then go out when you're in power and make the case for what you want and build some public support for it. And it's harder and you risk losing your window of opportunity but you also then have the potential to stay in power for a long time and build something sustainable instead of getting tossed out in two or four years. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, I think, I think it's just too easy for parties to tell themselves a different story and overreach in the first uh, year or two of an administration. I say, look, if there's anybody in my mind that is responsible for breaking breaking democracy uh, in America is probably Mitch McConnell, um, or at least Mitch McConnell in, in uh, conjunction with 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 Donald Trump. Uh, and though you know I'm I'm sickened at much of what uh, he has done, culminating in um, you know the, the pushing through a Supreme Court justice uh, eight days before an election after uh, the treatment that they gave to Merrick Garland. Um, I think there are lessons to be learned there. I hope they're, they're the right lessons. Um, and it's not uh, to, max, to, to, to accrue and utilize power at all means, but it is to use power uh, uh, strategically and to ultimately um, benefit and have impact on your constituency. So if the democratic uh, lesson is uh, if in fact, um, uh, the filibuster, uh, there's filibuster reform, and uh, we can pass uh, legislation by a simple majority uh, that is signed into uh, law by a, by a Democratic president very quickly. Uh, I hope and expect that Democrats will use that to do some pretty fundamental things, including um, uh, COVID relief, which we haven't been able to do in many months now, uh, including hopefully uh, securing um, uh, either a current or the, the, the next iteration of, uh, of ACA or, or Obamacare or Biden care, whatever you call it, um, looking at uh, fundamental uh, you know, jobs training and economic initiatives, given where we are, um, uh, doing infrastructure, which has been talked about for, for, for years. I mean, we have been at uh, stasis because we have been so unable to govern given the partisanship. And there is a, a crying need um, for for legislation, um, the Supreme Court itself has suggested that, uh, saying, you know, well, if you disagree with our opinions, legislate. And I would hope that um, that the that the Democratic lesson is to uh, is to use power uh, strategically and wisely. That's a good lesson. I hope all of the Democratic officials in the world were listening and are on this call. Um, but this, quest, this next question actually comes from Dean Glazer. Thank you so much for joining us. If there is another electoral misfire, namely a popular vote victory with an electoral vote loss, it would be three times in the past six elections. What will slash should, be, should the response be? Well, I, I mean, I I'll, I mean, we just talked about this a bit. Thank you, Dean Glazer, for tuning in. I appreciate it. I, I, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but as I said before, I mean, that's right. If you, if you have a third uh, example of that in this period, then I, you know, obviously the system has to be reformed. Um, you know, and, and I think it has to be reformed for a very pragmatic reason in addition to the fairness of the electoral process, which is 
the, the nature of reform is that you do the things that are obvious so that you do not uh, incentivize the things that are radical and not obvious. And I think we've seen that, you know, I, I, some of the calls for reform I really don't agree with. I don't agree with the, that the Senate is an example of inequity, the way the Senate is constructed. I actually think that, again, is part of a pretty visionary system created by the framers. We have a really fragilely balanced um, democracy that, you know, that, that sort of represents a genius of um, compromise and amalgamation. And, uh, and changing the electoral college, if in fact we were to get, you know, another election like that, not only this cycle, but in the next couple of cycles, I mean, I think the public would demand some kind of change. And, and absent that, I think you'd get a call for more radical reforms that I don't think would be good for the country. So I'd certainly be on board with that. But again, I don't think it's going to happen. And I think it's just as good a chance you know, you know, uh, by the way, Democrats spent a century benefiting from the network, from the uh, Electoral College. And granted, you know, the, the popular vote didn't differ from it, but they were not complaining when all of those rural states were voting Democrat. But just because it happened in the past yeah. doesn't necessarily That's exactly mean. right. Just because it happened in the past. But look, I think there's at least as good a chance of that. Uh, maybe I'm being too much of an optimist as, as that we've just gone through a really strange um an unusually divided and divisive period in American history that it has felt like all of your lifetimes, but in fact, 20 years is not a huge amount of time in American politics. Uh, and that, you know, we won't see it again, you know, that it will come back into alignment and that we won't see it again for a very long period of time. Um, but, but acknowledging that there is the possibility that the increasing urbanization of the country and the changing demographic uh, could create an unsustainable dynamic. But I, I continue to believe, you know, that, and, and this is related to this electoral issue, but I want to say it, even though it's, it's tangential, because I think it's important. I really do believe that Trumpism, whatever that is, the ref this reflection of intolerance and, uh, and exclusion and entrenched isolationism that we see in, in aspects of the society is a dwindling force, not a growing force. It, it, you know, I often say to people that you can sit on a train platform and, a, and, and a, uh, a, going slowly and a train passes you going much faster and you could swear that you're going backward, but you're not. You're actually just experiencing an illusion because the next train is going really fast. I don't think we're going backward as a country. I don't think the Trump movement, whatever it represents, is I think it is a loud, dwindling, dying ideology. Uh, and and uh, similarly, I think, you know, I think as as this demographic change takes hold, as younger voters become larger parts of the electorate, I just I don't think we're going to feel quite so out of sync uh, and quite so caught between moments uh, as as we do right now. I, I think the question is, can we make it to that point in a peaceful and stable manner? I mean, and and so, you know, thanks, Dean Glitcher, for being on. Um, if that if that were to happen, I mean, just to clarify, it would only happen with Biden winning the popular vote and and Trump winning the electoral college. I mean, there's not a chance that Biden will lose the popular vote at this point. I mean, he will likely be up, you know, more than the two or three percent that Hillary was, many fold. Um, Significantly more, probably. No, what? Significantly more. Probably. Yeah, yeah, significantly. I, I absolutely agree. So, so the question is, you know, is you know, and though it may be very narrow at this point, there is a a path to electoral college victory for uh, for Trump that probably goes through you know Pennsylvania and Florida and and, um, and a few other key states. Uh, so then your question is, if that happens, you know, is there is there a call for for fundamental reform, which means a whole bunch of disenfranchised Democrats and progressives and others with um, with Trump staying as as president? It's hard to imagine that there will be any real possibility of reform um, uh, while he is. Uh, while he is president, and I think you will see a, 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 a real increase in civil strife. I mean, I think that we will start, you know, looking, I hope at least that we would start looking more like kind of the 60s and people kind of really starting to express what this means to them um, and that there will be far more kind of mass movements as a way to address it. But I don't think you'll see any effort to to rectify it from the from the federal government as long as uh, Trump is, is 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 president what I what I do firmly agree is, is exactly as Matt said I mean the Republican Party has now positioned itself in a long-term you know kind of losing trajectory where they're increasingly reliant on a dwindling group of you know white uh, usually non-college educated 
uh, mostly men. And, and that is not sustainable given the democratic growth, uh, demogra the demographic trajectory. Um, and so at a certain point, it does, it has to right size. And, and there are those in the Republican party that recognizes. I mean, after, I think it was after the Romney loss, I mean, they commissioned this autopsy, which said all these things, we have to go out and broaden our appeal, you know, uh, that there, that, that we have to, uh, engage uh, Latino and Black voters and be more socially progressive on, uh, on on LGBTQ issues and any number of things. And it's exactly the direction that Trump turned the page on and went back to just exciting his his base. Um, but if Trump loses, with an, and with any luck, Republicans lose the Senate. You know, this is a real moment of reckoning for the Republican Party, and they will have to think very seriously about where they where they move. I think that I, I am not as sanguine, unfortunately, that Trumpism isn't here isn't here for a while. I mean, I think people have seen that it's um, it, it has worked, and that there is a constituency for it. And whether it's carried on by his kids in 2024, or Tom Cotton, or Ted Cruz, or any number of others, I think that that will be a hallmark of of future campaigns. But I hope that the rest of the Republican Party kind of wakes up and does some real reckoning um, uh, if they are uh, locked out of um, uh, both houses of Congress and the White House on where they, what they actually stand for at this point. Um, you know, are they still uh, a party that claims surprise uh, democracy and trade and economic opportunity and many of the things that they have uh, fiscal conservatism, all the things that they have turned their backs on over the last few years, um, and how they uh, uh, restructure themselves uh, for a constituency that um, that can actually be that can actually be competitive. So I, I, I think until we are at that period of alignment um, on the popular vote, and you know, that 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 hopefully will happen next week. But if if it doesn't, will happen at some election at some point soon. Uh, and the question is, what is our degree of um, stability between now and that point? By means of bringing this discussion together, we have a final question from an anonymous attendee who is wondering, given the origins of the- Anonymous. <laughs> it was finally revealed, but chosen to maintain secrecy here. Um, given the origins of the Electoral College and intentional gerrymandering and voter suppression tactics, which, which disproportionately affect historically oppressed populations in this country, what amount of reform is appropriate? The tough one. Uh, well, I'll, I mean, I'll say, look, I, you know, I, we've touched on a lot of it, I think, and, and um, there's always reform that's appropriate. And so uh, I would like to see changes in the way redistricting gets done. I think it's, you know, uh, I would like to see changes in the way people vote, you know, cities and municipalities have been uh, experimenting with uh, open primaries and ranked choice voting. I would, I would like to see voting go online. I know all the security experts tell us it's impossible and you can't do it, but this doesn't seem to be a great way when the postal service can't even deliver the ballots. And by the way, I can go do my, banking and credit cards and mortgage online. And that doesn't seem to be destroying the universe. So I, I, I do think eventually Americans will demand something like that. Uh, but again, I, you know, um, I, I do think, you know, it is possible to get too uh, focused and uh, obsessed with the, the margins in a sense of the democratic process, because we've been through this incredibly contested tumultuous period in politics. You know, democracy is it's a little bit like your bathroom scale. Like if you want to get on your bathroom scale and found out, find out, you know, if you lost 10 pounds since you last went in, that's, that's fine. That's going to be easy. But if you're looking for half pound gradations, you're going to find that every time you get on the scale, you weigh something different because it's not exact. And when you're deciding elections by one point in, or half a point in a state or half a point as a country, um, it, it's, it's not going to function perfectly ever. It never has. John Kennedy probably won election in 1960 by a bunch of stolen votes. It, it is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's never going to be an exact measuring instrument. And when your elections turn on tiny margins, I think it exaggerates the importance of a lot of the technical aspects of the vote. Uh, but I, I 
I don't think that's a permanent state of affairs for the reasons we've been discussing. And I think the history of, of, of American and the, and the direction, the future direction of democratic change suggests uh, that, that uh, we, we won't always have elections decided by one point or half a point. And, and we, will, uh, we are capable of being a country with enough consensus and enough, um, you know, a, 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 enough um, predictability, stability in the system so that we don't have to, um, you know, be always uh, concerned about the technicalities of the electoral process. And I would just say, um, look, I think there's an enormous amount of reform that is necessary, but this is also, um, you know, we're not we're we're not starting from from um, at, at a blank slate. I mean, we know we know some of the things that we need to do to help to help heal ourselves, and there's plenty of proposals out there. And again. Um, I just looked up since I had mentioned HR one, just making sure that I was right about it. And and I think that you would go back to that. Certainly, I think um, a, a Democratic House with Speaker Pelosi would pass that again uh, very early in the next session. And a Democratic Senate, um, which uh, doesn't need a 60 vote threshold, may well uh, pass it. And um, and it goes to some fundamental aspects of a healthy democracy. That includes um, its focus is on expanding voting rights. Um, uh, addressing extreme gerrymandering and overhauling campaign finance reform, okay, overhauling campaign finance issues or campaign finance reform. All three of those issues obviously have a really uh, uh, corrosive effect on, on democracy uh, right now. And I think if we can start to address those, that is a really, that is a really good start. Um, and, um, uh, and there's obviously going to continue to be more and more to be done, but we have a, we have a blueprint for it. Uh, and hopefully we will have um, the, the 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 means and the vehicle to move to move forward with it after after we see what happens next Tuesday. And the voting rights part is the most critical one, as you mentioned, Dan. I, the campaign finance thing to me feels overrated at this point because I think it matters less and less. Although locally, it probably still has a huge impact. But I think you know the lowest hanging fruit there is the voting is you know rededicating legislatively the country to voting rights everywhere. I mean, some of the suppression stuff we're seeing, it's that really is a step backward in Southern states and, 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 you know, Republican states is really, you know, we, we had laws on the books against it's intolerable and that, you know, fixing that I think is probably the top priority. Absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, wait, Dan, go ahead. You're going to say something. No, no, I was just going to agree and say, let's hope we have the opportunity. Um, and, uh, and we'll see. We haven't really even talked about, um, and I know we're at time, and we haven't really talked about the election. I, uh, um, I am a, <laughs> I am a, I am a worrier. Um, I, uh, uh, I've taken, I've taken online that Secretary Albright, who I've worked with fairly closely, uses, which is that she remains an optimist, but an optimist that worries a lot. So, uh, with that in mind, um, we'll see what happens next week. There are certainly many scenarios that keep me up late at night if it comes down to. Pennsylvania uh, or some of these other states and and given given what Trump has done in terms of trying to delegitimize this this election there are also quite good odds that it could be fairly clear cut that that Biden is the winner and even if um, even if he refuses to concede that at a certain point uh, his enablers um, in Congress and elsewhere uh, tell him that that it is time and um, and that we have, a hopefully smooth transition of power, which is the hallmark of our democracy. It may still be a hostile transition. I don't expect his administration to necessarily work closely with um, with the Biden team, um, but um, but uh, certainly uh, preparations are in place to move quickly if there is a Biden administration and to um, and start uh, uh, redressing the many the many inequities of the last few years. Thank you both so much. I think hope and optimism, I think that's gonna resonate with all of us. But as we close out this critical discussion, I think one thing that we would want from you two is just how do we go forward? What do we read? What do we watch? How do we carry ourselves um, going forward these next few days, this next week? Well, I, I, I think, you know, many people have said it, but the most important role in, in a democracy, obviously, is, in, is an informed citizen. Um, and uh, I would come back. I hope Saul is still 
on the line because I will always remember and I tell my kids it and everything else. I mean, the, his, um, his decision when he was provost to make sure that every freshman had a New York Times um, on, their, on their doorstep when they, um, uh, when they started school uh, and, uh, and how, to, um, how to digest news in a critical manner and make sure that, um, that you keep abreast of these issues. And I think what has transpired in the 35 years since I was a freshman um, is, uh, is really remarkable in terms of the proliferation of social media and the rise of disinformation. And so making sure that we are all um, critical uh, readers and assessors in terms of our information that we're out there trying to um, ascertain what the truth is and that there is still an objective truth despite what uh, Trump says and that we um, act on those. And I think that there is reason for hope in much of, in much of that. I mean, look at what, um, look at the the increase in, in uh, youth voter um, uh, activism um, and, uh, and, and efforts um, by um, you and your peers. Um, I see it with my kids who are in high school leading uh, uh, voter mobilization efforts um, and, um, and to continue to um, uh, inculcate that, that uh, activism and an effort for citizens to be truly engaged in the process. And, and, um, and I hope that we have um, of many years of that ahead of us. Yeah, I really agree with what, what Dan said about that. And just uh, being, being informed and, and I, I do believe there's a lot of um, cause for optimism. And so I, I think, you know, part of what's happened is that this president, as Dan said earlier, is, is dedicated himself to delegitimizing institutions. It's basically how he has conducted his entire career, even before politics. Uh, and it's the reason he's been successful where people thought not possible. Everybody says, well, how, how can you go after John McCain and generals? How do you go after the CIA, the NFL, the Pope? He'll never survive this. He always survives. And the reason is that Trump understands that the institution is not the people, that if that Catholics are are concerned about the church and baseball fans feel that the commissioner's corrupt and soldiers feel that the generals are wrong and that you know we have we have developed it's incredibly anti-institutional bent in the country uh, over a tumultuous couple of decades and he's really been able to exploit that and um, and and so my you know I think the danger is that you can oppose his ideology and be activist and vote and do the things that a citizen should do and yet find your delegitimized, find that it, it bleeds into your worldview. And you can start to see the institutions of government as less legitimate uh, and the institutions of media as less legitimate and start to feel uh, you know, as, as though nothing can be trusted because, uh, because Trump and his administration could not be trusted. Uh, and I think you have to fight that. I think, uh, I, th I, th I think it's gonna be incumbent upon all of us. I mean that, you know, I don't mean that as a cliche. I mean, all of us working in the media, and working on the political side and all of you going out and working in jobs and we have institutions to shore up and protect. I take this really seriously and I hope that Joe Biden, should he be elected next week, you know, at least on the media piece takes this very seriously too and is very deliberate about how he builds his operation in the White House to rebuild trust between the media and the White House and between the media and the country because we need that. And it's partly the media's fault, but not entirely. Um, and, you know, th these institutions have taken a battering. Uh, and so I would ask you to guard against cynicism because you've got to be part of the solution. If we can't restore the trust in those institutions, then we, they, uh, the, the country just can't function. On this worried but optimistic note, I'd like to say thank you so much to both Matt and Dan for joining us, Chi Chi for helping this all run so smoothly, to all of our sponsors for helping make this happen, and to our audience for participating and being a part of this important discussion. Thank you for sharing a part of your evening with us, and if you haven't already, please vote. Thank you all so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys.